So I watched this debate on the problem of evil with Trent Doherty and Skylar Fiction, and wow, did this debate go off the rails. I mean, it really wasn't a very productive debate. It was a total dumpster fire, actually. Um, to be perfectly fair to Skylar, uh, it seems like there's some history between him and this gentleman. I don't know the person, Trent Doherty, but it started, it seemed like it started to go off the rails when Trent started insisting that Skylar form, put, his, uh, his art, put his ideas into argument form and start expressing them as a syllogism. Now, I've never seen anybody do that in a debate. And to be fair to Skylar, I perfectly understand why he was hesitant to do it. It seemed to me like an unfair tactic, um, as it seemed to Skylar. You know, why do you need me to do that? It seems like you're just doing that so, so that you can debunk what I have to say easier. That's what it seemed like to me, too. So that's where it looked like it started going off the rails and into nanny nanny poo poo land, because that turned into sort of a power struggle. I don't want to do that. You have to do that. I don't want to. Um, you know, that's where, that's where it started to degenerate. And change from a positive conversation into whatever, a free-for-all. Having said that, the second part of it, you know, I was kind of on Skylar. Skylar brought an example to the table where he said, um, you know, there's this child who's being held prisoner for X amount of years and sexually abused. Now, what Skylar doesn't seem to recognize is that he was defining all of the parameters of here is a piece of evidence that God is uncaring or hard-hearted in this particular situation. Let me give you all the parameters. And, what, and his, his objection to that, or his question about that, was perfectly legitimate. He said, how do we know? How do we know that that was completely unjustified and there was no redemptive purpose to it whatsoever? You know, we're going off of a piece of evidence that you're bringing to the table. I perfectly understand why he objected to that. Now, here's the issue. It's one thing if you are trying to, sometimes Skyler enters into these conversations um, and he's, he objected, Trent objected to this and I get this too. He says, you know, I'll try to answer something, then you just change the point. It, he kind of pulls the machine gun. You know, he's, for example, he brings up this, this example of, in this situation, brings up this example of this theoretical child who's being molested for extra amount of years and there's no redemptive purpose to it whatsoever. And Trent starts acting, asking perfectly legitimate questions or trying to answer that one leg of it, and then he machine guns into other points. Now, why is that important? Because in, a, in, a, in the problem of evil is a real philosophical conversation, and it's a really challenging philosophical conversation. It cannot be entered into simply under let's be the theist. If, if that's what you're trying to do, you shouldn't, you shouldn't involve, get involved with something you know, this intense. If your goal is just to beat the theist, it's, it, it doesn't serve this type of conversation. It's a challenging philosophical conversation. The theist is not going to answer it in a YouTube video debate. I mean, let's just be real about it. It's something that people have wrestled with for thousands of years. So if your goal is just, okay, let's jump to this and let's, let's try and win the debate, that's, that's not productive. I'm not saying that's exactly what Skyler was doing, but he was doing too much of that. You know, it's one thing to do that, to have like Matt Powell on your channel and beat him up. You know, easy to do, fine, go for it. But in a situation like this where you're trying to have a real philosophical conversation, I get why he objected to that. Because he gave you a real, a real question. You put forth something that was, I think, in good faith. Here is this situation that seems to have no redemptive purpose to it whatsoever. And he said, how do we know? How do we know the full parameters of this, of this example you've given? And that's a perfectly legitimate question. But think of it this way, okay? As I see the problem of evil, it is, it is ultimately it's a, bait, a debate about the character and the integrity of God. What type of being are we dealing with? And as it's usually put forth, we're either dealing with a God that's not omnibenevolent or not omnipotent. Either can't do anything about this child or won't. Now, in terms of the omnibenevolence of God, we don't need to take an example a theoretical example that is being pulled from, you know, a newspaper article or something you see on TV. That's the real problem with the anti-theist, atheist approach, is they take examples of the most extreme evils that they can find, say, look, see, there's no redemptive purpose whatsoever, see, God is either indifferent or cruel. As if those are the, exa the only examples of God's omnibenevolence. If we're talking about the omnibenevolence of God, we're actually, actually asking a real question is 
first we're, we're, we're asking, is this potential being actually omnibenevolent? Then we have to look at the real evidence. And you need to look no further than your own life. Yeah, you brought up one example of a child who it seemed like had nothing good happen to her. But then you go down the street, and the playground where you live, any town USA, any playground in America, you'll see children right now as we speak. The sun is shining over their head, and they are laughing, having a good time, and they are playing and enjoying themselves without a care in the world. That is real world, in your face, right in front of your face, evidence of the omnibenevolence of God. And you need to count that as evidence if we're talking about a summation of the character of God. If we're actually asking the question, how can God allow this? And we're balancing in it on whether there's more evil or good, whether evil, whether there's too much evil in the world to justify the fact that God is omnibenevolent, then we have to take into consideration evidence of the omnibenevolence. Do you understand what I mean? For example, in my own life, there's tons of real world, right in front of my face, evidence of the omnibenevolence of God. Looking right now, my beautiful cat. I just got a phone call from my beautiful wife. I have a nice little apartment on the beach. The sun is shining over the beach in Southern California. And, you know, life is pretty good. That's more than enough evidence for the omnibenevolence of God. And that's real world evidence that's available to me. If you're going to make a case that God is either cruel, evil, which, which anti-theists and atheists will do, and you pull something like, okay, I just saw on TV someone got machine gunned, and that was terrible. Yeah, but that's a theoretical tragedy. I am experiencing firsthand the omnibenevolence of God. We Christians trust the character of God. It's one of the only times where faith is used correctly. We have faith in his character. So we have an answer, both in the personal, for evil in the personal, and evil in the collective. And it's trust in the character of God. Of said being, if we're actually tell, if we're actually correct, okay. I get most of you are atheists, but keep in mind we're having a theoretical, we're having a theological discussion about whether this being is omnibenevolent and omnipotent. Okay, this isn't a discussion about whether he exists or not. We're saying if he exists, is he omnibenevolent? And case and we're, Skyler presents a case against his omnibenevolence. Here's a terrible thing that theoretically happened to this child somewhere. And I'm saying, here is evidence for his omnibenevolence. Here is tons of benevolence in the real world right in front of my face that I have easy access to. These theoretical examples of his, of his cruelty or his indifference to human suffering, I don't experience in the real world. So I either A, give him the benefit of the doubt, or assume there's something going on in that situation that I don't know about that makes it somehow okay or redemptive. That's not too far a leap of the imagination. That's actually normal. In other words, I experienced directly God's omnibenevolence. As I said, I got a beautiful wife, beautiful cat. She got a nice, cool new Jeep. We're doing fine. We're doing fine. Living on the beach, living large. Well, not living large, but you know, whatever. We're getting by. But we're doing fine. We're going to go see a movie tonight have a good time. More than enough ample evidence of God's omnibenevolence. Now, you try and darken my, my assessment of the character of God by bringing up theoretical abstractions of evil. Yeah, I understand that evil actually exists in the real world. But as of this hearing and as of this day, it is still an aberration. The poor child who got sexually abused, fine. Go look at the, go to the playground on your street right now. And you'll see far more children living well and having a good time. And there's ample evidence of the omnibenevolence of God. So, the second leg of it is, is God omnipotent? And as I pointed out in other videos, no, not necessarily, not in all situations. The Bible's pretty crystal clear on that. Theologically speaking, no, he's not. He's only theoretically omnipotent. What does that mean? It means God can sort of do what he wants, whatever is logically possible in all situations in the world, yes, but he has, of his own accord, limited his power in certain situations. So he either cannot or will not intervene. And it's effectively the same. So you have a situation where a guy is theoretically abusing a child for years upon years upon years. The better question to ask is, what is wrong with that guy? Not why does God allow it? Because God only allows it in that situation. And he allows it far less frequently than it would occur given the moral condition of humanity. That's the point. You say, here's a real example of evil in the real world, a holocaust. And I say, well, there was only one that happened in Europe. 
Actually, two. Okay, there was the, yeah, there's the Armenian, World War I. Look it up. Look it up. Hitler himself actually said, you know, who remembers the Armenians? So there were two genocides in Europe in the last 150 years. There's however many in Africa, what? There was Rwandan genocide, a couple in Africa, and there was Cambodia. Let's say there's 15 genocides overall in the last 150 years. Why did God allow it? Well, there could have been one every year. That's the way anti-theists and atheists talk about the world we live in. Like there are kids with cancer being sexually abused all over, right in front of your face, everywhere. You talk about it as if this is evidence, real world evidence of, of the evil or bad intent of God. That's what I'm trying to say. But not anybody listening to this video is in a concentration camp right now. Very few of you are suffering from horrible diseases right now in the real world. You're experiencing omnibenevolence directly. But you're talking about evil as if the balance of evil is somehow really tilted in favor of a terrible world. It isn't. It's even close. And what the Bible clearly tells you is that the reason there's so much evil in the world is the moral condition of humanity, not God. Humanity. It's not the moral condition of God that makes the world so evil. It's the moral condition of humankind. So the real question to ask is, what's wrong with that guy? What is wrong with human beings that he would want to torture a small girl for X amount of years? Isn't it a good argument that we need something like a savior? I think it's a pretty decent argument that we need something like a savior. Why does God allow it is a question, but it's a limited question. That's what he was trying to get at. Why does God allow it? We're not really sure. Why does God allow it in that one situation? But if God removed his sovereign hand, it would be happening all the time, constantly, because that's the moral condition of humanity. That's the argument in the Bible. Maybe God allows it in certain limited situations so you get a real, real, real world view of what the life would be like if God were to remove his hand. People would revert into Nazis. That's the argument in the Bible, that that's what we are. That Nazis weren't beamed down from outer space. There's some sort of alien race of evil beings. That those are actual human beings. And that's how human beings actually behave if they are left to their own devices. That's the argument of evil. That's the real problem of evil. What's the matter with human beings? Not why does God allow it in limited circumstances sometimes. So if you look at the book of Job, the book of Job addresses this, this problem of evil in the world head on. And it comes up with two really interesting answers. And they're answers. God says, go this far, but no further. In other words, I'm sovereign. That girl had, had a seven-year history of torture, and it, as it looks like, there's no redemptive purpose whatsoever. I get that. But it had a beginning, middle, and end. A beginning, middle, and end. God said, go this far and no further. Torture for X amount of years. And we don't know what happened to that girl after that fact. If she, if she gets to go to heaven and live forever in paradise... See what I'm saying? And what he was saying was actually kind of correct. If we're talking about Christian theology, you have to factor in. Eventually, most of us, most of you listening to this, according to Christian theology, well, I don't believe in God. Yeah, you might, you might slide through. That's fine. You might slide through. I'm guessing you probably will. If God is actually omnibenevolent, you know, maybe he'll help you, help you believe in him right before it's time for you to meet him. And you'll slide through with the rest of us. Because theoretical, if we're talking about theoretical evil, then let's talk about theoretical paradise. Because according to Christian theology, there comes a time where this world ends. And in the world of God's choosing, where God is actually sovereignly in control, and free will has somehow been eradicated, there is no sickness, no sorrow, no death, and no suffering, and no evil to speak of. And everybody gets to live forever. Hallelujah, no child gets... No child gets left behind. <laughs> no child gets left behind. I don't know. No child gets diddled by someone who doesn't want it to happen. I'm not exactly sure what he said was going on with the girl. She was being touched where she didn't want to be touched. I forget what he said. So that's the point. Uh, what was the point? Yeah, I'm rambling a little. Okay, so his question was legitimate. We don't know what the full story of that girl's life is. So we can't just assume that only evil was visited upon her and there was no redemptive purpose in her life whatsoever. That's too much assuming. We can kind of think that it happened somewhere and that's what an atheist will jump to. Well, look, 
Here's, here's an example where there's no redemptive purpose whatsoever, just suffering upon suffering and sorrow upon sorrow. Maybe. But those are limited examples in a world where there's endless amounts of, of evidence of God's omnibenevolence. Endless. Endless. Just in my own life, almost endless amounts of evidence of God's omnibenevolence. And almost everybody listening to me, same thing. Honestly, almost anybody listening to this video, same idea. Look around. You got kids? Endless amounts of evidence of God's omnibenevolence. So I'm sick of my kids. Okay, you're sick of them a little. But you love them, I hope. See what I'm saying? It's not really a real question. Most of you live a life where you actually, if there is a God, that's potentially a real question. But if there is a God, is his character good, is really obvious by the world itself. If you don't recognize that you live, that life is a profound gift, and that is really, really, really overwhelmingly good in favor of evil, then you've got a deeper problem than you should be debating on YouTube videos. I'm not saying that that's what Skyler's at, I'm just saying. So, that's how I see it. Yeah, a little rambling, but, you know, whatever. Whatever, that's all for now. Amen.